Hello, I'm Christine Salvador, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. New salmon seasons are underway in Washington, and some of the first opportunities are in South Puget Sound. Get a license, a catch record card, and give it a try. Well, we're out here in the middle of beautiful Puget Sound. It's July, the weather's beautiful, and we're fishing for salmon. A lot of salmon anglers, July is the month when salmon angling really takes off, whether you're fishing in Puget Sound or out on the coast. We're down here near Tacoma today, and this southern end of Puget Sound will be a really good bet from about mid-July all the way through the end of September. We've got five major hatcheries that uh, produce Chinook for this end of the sound, and all of those uh, salmon will be coming back through here. Uh, the peak of the run will be about mid-August. For those of you that are a little more adventurous, the coast is open. Um, we've got uh, pretty good Chinook season on the coast. Uh, all of the areas are now open. As you swing around and come on inside, CQ and, and Port Angeles have opened up for the Chinook Selective Fishery. Uh, we're expecting a good fishery out there again this year. The quota is about the same. Hopefully that Selective Fishery will go through the end of July. Uh, out there you have to release your uh, wild fish. Those are the ones that have an adipose fin. Um, after uh, July gets over and the Selective Fishery starts to logging down for Chinook, uh, humpies or pinks and uh, Hatchery coho should start to take off, and that'll be pretty good all the way through the end of August, and then coho should carry September out there in CQ and Port Angeles. Coming down into Area 10, we've got some uh, nice terminal fisheries in uh, Sinclair Inlet. That's a two-hatchery schnook area. That's open. It's open seven days a week there. Uh, Elliott Bay opens July 8th, and that'll be open through noon on August 22nd. About August, uh, the pink ought to be coming in really strong just about everywhere in Puget Sound. We've kind of made some regulation changes this year. We've simplified things. The bonus pink limit is in place for areas 5 through 11, and it starts whenever the, those areas open. So if the area opens July 1st, the bonus pink limit starts. If it opens August 1st, the bonus pink limit starts August 1. We hope that will simplify the regulations and make it easier for people to go target those pinks. Uh, the good pink fishing should start out in that CQ area about mid-July and peak around uh, the 1st of August or early in August. So overall, we are expecting a good year. We should have nearly the number of Chinook we had last year. We've got some good coho runs, have some outstanding pink runs. So this is truly a, one of those years when folks want to get their boat ready, get their fishing tackle ready, and get out there on the water and go uh, chase these fine critters that we have, these uh, Pacific salmon. They're delicious to eat and they're fun to catch, so get out there and go find them. You can also fish for salmon on many Washington lakes. The Kokanee will provide you with one of the best small boat family fishing experiences you'll ever find. There are several ways to fish for Kokanee. Um, you can still fish at night using glow uh, hooks and corn, tipped with corn. Uh, you can jig for kokanee, or you can troll. Today we'll be trolling for kokanee using a dodger-type lure and a tube fly. Now the tube fly will be tipped with shoe pig white corn. Uh, Jolly Green Giant works the best. And um, we'll be fishing at about 50 feet deep, trolling behind, uh, trolling off of downriggers, about 50 feet ba back behind the boat as well. Color is a big thing. White corn is important. Um, the shoe pig corn just seems to work better, and I'm quite frankly, I don't exactly know why. But uh, that's what uh, is used. That's what the most popular bait, and it's very, very uh, effective. This is a great way to get fids, kids into uh, fishing. The uh, kokanee are very cooperative fish, and uh, they're they're a great fight, a beautiful fish, and a great table fare as well. The typical limit for kokanee is five fish per angler. Uh, there are some lakes that where we have bonus limits of uh, 10 fish and even 16 fish, so you want to make sure you check your pamphlet to uh, take a full advantage of the kokanee opportunity we have. Kokanee fishing takes place in a nice time of the year. It's in the spring and, and throughout the summer, so the uh, wa uh, weather is fairly cooperative and nice and warm. Uh, kokanee will 
a bite during this time of the year, uh, you want to fish a little bit deeper uh, during the warmer summer months. It's a good time to take the family out. Weather is comfortable and, uh, and it's safe. Kids will have a blast kokanee fishing. Uh, the fish are feisty little fish and they, they bite pretty readily. Every summer, well-meaning but misinformed people pick up what they think are abandoned wild babies, from deer fawns to sealed pups. They bring them to us for care. Please don't. Last month, a Spokane area wildlife officer had to be temporary mom for twin fawns that were taken from the wild. Middle of June, beginning of June, uh, we're having a lot of fawns born. And unfortunately, one of the survival techniques of the deer is the doe will leave the fawns down in, in a field or along a brush line and the doe will leave and the fawns are left there for eight to ten hours until the doe comes back. Unfortunately, we have uh, people, hikers, campers, joggers, homeowners that find the fawn and mistakenly pick them up thinking they're doing the right thing on an abandoned fawn and then they turn them over to us. Um, when that happens, what they've done is they've removed the fawn from its natural habitat. The doe, of course, is not around. They think it's died. And then we have these orphan fawns. They chose to bring the fawns back to Spokane, turn them over to us. Our, one of our officers contacted them last night, picked them up, brought them over here. We stored them overnight. Now they're headed over to Ponte's. Ponte's Veterinary Clinic in the Valley does a lot of our rehab work and they take our orphan fawns and uh, raise them and then they're turned loose. Okay. The public is not allowed by state law, RCW 7715, they're not allowed to possess wildlife, live wildlife taken from the wild. It is a gross misdemeanor and the fines are $500. Um, so in addition to destroying the animal's opportunity to live a life out in the wild, uh, folks can actually be subject to severe fines. You know, across, across the state this time of year, we're getting numerous calls from uh, seal pups on the beach where the, the mother leaves the animal on the beach so it can go forage and it's a safe place that the seal has chosen to leave the pup. Uh, we have the fawns now, we have baby um, uh, calf um, elk, we have moose, the bear uh, cubs are coming out and being around. Uh, everything from the denning coyote to the birds that are having the young starting to fall out of their nests, they need to be left in place. They need to be left where they are. The parents most likely are around, one of them is most likely around so that they can care for their young. Once we take them out of the wild, yes, we have rehabilitation programs, but their life is never the same once you remove them from the wild. The, the alternative is not good. While tracking a radio collared adult female cougar, a WDFW biologist discovered she had a kitten. This presented an opportunity to study the early habits of the kitten and its migration patterns. So the kitten is now wearing its own radio collar. Well, this is an adult female that we had collared with a GPS collar. She's been on the air for approximately two years. We took her GPS locations and uh, once we had those locations downloaded, we looked and we saw there was a large cluster site. And she is going to be in one place for like 10 days like that if she has a kill or she has, a, has kittens. We suspected she might have a kitten or kittens. We went uh, into that site and were able to discover a small kitten that was about, probably about that time, about three weeks old. Uh, we continued to monitor and we went back in when the kitten was a little older at five weeks and captured this kitten and put a small transmitter on it and this is going to be an opportunity for us to learn really for kind of the first time in Washington is what happens to cougar kittens how long do they live how far do they roam uh, what are the mortality sources are do they travel with their mother uh, those kind of issues that currently we really have very limited information on it's going to really help us with a lot of our modeling efforts because we model cougar populations and one of the key components in those models is juvenile mortality and survival. It's pretty unusual to be able to get in and find something like this and to be able to 
monitor it for a long period of time is going to be very interesting, and we anticipate we'll be doing more of this in the future. The Oak Creek Wildlife Area is best known for its winter elk feeding. However, Oak Creek is a great year-round family destination and is loaded with outdoor opportunities and offers a wide diversity of Washington's wildlife habitat. Uh, Oak Creek is, is a, a great example of that. We have clean, clear rivers running through it. Um, we have cliffs and caves and talus slopes, oak woodlands, uh, mature ponderosa pine forests, and all of the various creatures that live in those habitats. We have two major highways that go through. They bisect the, the Oak Creek Wildlife Area, which makes it easy access for families, uh, there's multiple places where they can pull right off the highway, right alongside a beautiful river, and set up tents. Uh, camping, fire is a, is a concern in eastern Washington through most of the summer, so, uh, so camping uh, with, with outdoor fires is limited. But uh, there's beautiful areas. Uh, it's, it's dispersed remote camping. We don't provide facilities as an agency, but um, you can almost put up a tent and enjoy the outdoors anywhere. We have uh, a number of fishing opportunities uh, in the rivers. We have uh, many streams that run through the property. We have a two or three mountain lakes, and one is right alongside uh, Highway 12, Tim's Pond, and uh, the department plants that with legal-sized fish and some jumbo-sized fish. So occasionally that uh, six, seven-year-old young fisherman gets quite a, quite a thrill at the end of his line. And we have a lot of other recreational opportunities. Um, with the diversity of, of land forms and habitats. Uh, one of the popular ones is rock climbing. Right across uh, from the headquarters is uh, uh, an area called Royal Columns, very popular. We have uh, mountain biking. We have uh, snowshoeing in the winter. We have cross-country skiing in the winter. We have a lot of photography, a lot of bird watching, uh, a great diversity of neotropical birds on Oak Creek. The Department of Fish and Wildlife wants to protect and maintain what we have in Washington. And uh, we hope that the people remember that uh, they're visiting and so their impacts can dramatically change some of those uh, warm fuzzies and, and little furries that they like to see. So be, be aware of that and uh, enjoy your time, but uh, try to make it a minimal impact. Introduce yourself to some of the residents of Oak Creek while we show you some places to see Washington's wildlife in the coming weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again.